come once again to discuss things. Welcome to another episode of Kiki Gentlemen. This is the beginning of Horror Month. Bleh! <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're in our, our second episode of Horror Month, and we are doing horror fan films uh, this month. Um, so, Manos, what are we reviewing today? We are reviewing a Silent Hill fan film called Lost Love. Indeed. So, um... I'm pretty sure I know the answer for you, but I'm just going to say, I've never played a Silent Hill game. Have you? Me neither. I've seen that movie back in, what, 2007? Uh, no, I haven't even seen the movie, so you got more experience on it than I do. Yeah, uh, and I'm not even sure how true to the video game that is, uh, or to the universe. So, I do know it has this huge expanded, like, kind of, like, universe with all these characters and stories and mythos. I don't know a damn thing. I just know it's about a creepy abandoned town with ghosts and demons and shit like that. Hmm. Yeah, I... See, I don't even know that. Uh, like, the only thing I know about Silent Hill is that there's a boss called Pyramid Head. Yep. Who, like, at one point in the game you see raping a washing machine. Yeah. Um, as, and you, as you do. As you do. Um, and so that's really the only thing I know about Silent Hill, and so this makes it really interesting to try to review this, because we've talked about this with fan films before, right? Where, like, usually when a studio comes out and says, like, we made this for the fans, it's bullshit, and they really have no ground to stand on, and they're just trying to make excuses for why they made a bad movie. But, like, legitimately, when a fan film is made, and I have no idea what's going on, I can't really criticize it for that if I've not been exposed to the source material because it's literally being made for fans by fans. True. And so it puts I, me in a really awkward space when I'm trying to talk about this. I have a particular belief when you do adaptations is that you shouldn't have to do, it shouldn't require homework to enjoy uh, an adaptation of something. Uh, you should be able to sit down and either watch or read um, the adaptation of what, because it has to, like, stand up to a new audience, which is why they're, you know, even adapting something. You know, why bother mm -hmm. making a uh, a live-action film of, I don't know, like uh, Attack on Titan, um, if you're not trying to reach out to an, uh, a group of new audiences? If you're just trying to... Uh, appeal to the same audience that are just enjoying Attack on Titan, well then, why bother even making that? There's no reason mm -hmm. to. Uh, but So yeah, and it should stand up uh, enough where like a novice can like sit down and watch or read uh, the adaptation and enjoy it for what it is and maybe get interested in the original thing. Uh, I am a little looser on that belief when it comes to fan films, because these are literally made by the fans with a lot of like sometimes uh, sometimes a lot of like geeky subtext that you know mm -hmm. and and trivia almost like yeah it's almost like trivia done in film form you know with fan films sometimes yeah and and what's interesting about that is kind of the intent behind a lot of these things because there's the fan films that are made by, like, a group of friends that are just really passionate about the thing and, and want to, you know, try making a film. And then there's the fan films that are being made as, like, a proof of concept uh, for a director or team that they're just trying to kind of get their name out there, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, this, I feel, very much more falls into the first option. Not that it's not semi-professionally done it's not like incompetent but it certainly doesn't seem like they're trying to market themselves to the widest possible audience as a proof of concept for their skills as a production team yeah um so i don't know that that puts me in a really odd place because i feel like i've kind of been dancing around it unintentionally 
I didn't care for this, mostly because I didn't know what the hell was going on, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what the hell was going on because I don't know anything about Silent Hill, I think. Like, yep. you, the directors or whatever could, could come on to this and be like, well, if you just played the games, you'd understand this, this, and this. It'd be like, okay, fair. And I haven't played the games, so I don't. So maybe that... It, it's just a weird place when we're reviewing fan films and we don't have any exposure to the source material. But, you know, once we try to put this more definite uh, thing where we're only going to review horror fan films that does definitely cut what we can select. So it, it kind of creates situations like this from time to time. I guess I'm a little bit luckier. Uh, I'm familiar with some of the basics of what Silent Hill is, you know, just because of the film. I only watched the one film. I know there's like, I think, two more movies. Really? Yeah. Uh, I think they were direct to video. Uh, well, wow. I th think the third one was definitely. But... Um, uh, yeah, I've never played the game, but I've seen the film, and I've watched a number of reviews from Phelis, who was a huge Silent Hill fan. So there's some other things about Silent Hill in the universe I've learned just simply watching his videos uh, discuss them, uh, mm -hmm. where there's a lot more going on besides Pyramid Head. He, he's kind of just... He's not even that important in the universe as far as what he does and who he is. Um, he's almost just like a basic monster. Uh, mm -hmm. that kind of has gotten a little too popular where there's a, a whole bunch of other things going on in the universe. Um, and, he, well, he's a very easily iconic thing. Also, um, Silent Hill is where the creepy nurses come from. You know, uh, the ones that are in the class, the, the, the real weird, sexy, creepy nurses with the, the classic nurse outfit, and they have these hideous, like, odd faces, and they, like, have blood on them. I don't know if you've mm. seen... I don't know if you've seen those two uh, things. There's usually off, often the the other iconic thing from Silent Hill. Outside of, like, the uh, emergency... Not emergency horn. The I guess the emergency horn. Siren? The siren, thank you. Uh, outside of the yeah, air raid siren or something that goes off. Which means uh, shit's going down. <laughs> and you gotta look out. Uh, mm. That's all I know of. Of that kind of thing um there is kind of a i really do enjoy the aesthetic you know i wish i i probably could get into silent hill because there have been like like extended universe books that have come out over the last few years and i think comics as well so i mean i don't have to play the game to kind of get into the world a little bit um mm -hmm. So there is that. Well, since you you seem slightly more knowledgeable here. Only how slightly. You, yeah, how did you feel about the way this fan film captured at least the atmosphere, the mood of Silent Hill? Uh, I think that's basically what it uh, achieved. It, um, it didn't really seem to kind of latch on to any like, specific uh, tropes of the, of the series or, or, or any of the plot details of... Um, any of the stories I've been told about. Um, you know, there is the uh, siren. We do hear that, although I'm not sure how it affects the plot. This is the thing about the, the story is I, I, I feel like this story could have been told without the, the wrapping of Silent Hill around it. It's like he had uh, a story in mind uh, and he loved Silent Hill, so he kind of put them together. And I'm not sure if necessarily you know, this feels too much like uh, a Silent Hill production. <laughs> yeah. The Silent See, Hill I don't know production, I've, yes. I don't know, I watched this, I'm like, I don't really even have a definitive take on what the story is. Yeah. Um, like, I had to go back and watch the, rewatch the two lines of dialogue that are in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, Alice, you need to let me go. And she's like, but if I let you go, who will ever love me? And then he kind of, like, fades away like a ghost, question mark? That's what I got, and then, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, I'm wondering, so then what was all the stuff in the beginning? Is that, like, him being trapped as a spirit in Silent Hill, or... I don't. I just don't exactly know what's going on, and I'm not sure if knowledge of the games would help that or not. Um, I don't think, I'll be honest, I don't think it will. Um, this is what I take, because I, uh, I watched this a couple times. Because I had a vague idea of what I was feeling. 
so essentially what I'm getting out of um, this is I do feel like he died in a car crash, maybe in Silent Hill. And he isn't aware of that, apparently, and is looking for her. And I think that's I think that's the intent of the filmmaker to make it look like, you know, she's in trouble and he's got to find her uh, only to realize that, um, you know, he's the one that is dead. Although, oh, shit, I just remembered. Um, there is this thing where um, if you enter Silent Hill, uh, there's a possibility you could get lost in this kind of like second ghost dimension where even if you get out of silent hill you still can't reach out and touch people you're in this sort of secondary universe where you can stay you're like a ghost okay and so maybe that's what's going on with him but then like he hugs her and she seems to pretty directly reply to him so i'm pretty sure the implication is that he's like she is aware that he's there in some capacity yeah uh well the dialogue could have you know if he hadn't hugged her and you know we could definitely tell that you know well there are two people there and one hugs the other so the other has the obvious physical like uh reaction to that um like if they hadn't done that they could have gotten off maybe with the explanation like you know uh, uh, uh like six cents like mm-hmm. you know you think that one character is always there and talking to people, and you just make the assumption, and then you realize at the end, like, oh, no, they never were there. Um, yeah, they could have played that dialogue off that way. Um, but, but then there's the hug, yeah. Yeah, and then the hug There's the hug, met. and then they're like, then he, like, picks up the letter and, sh- and drops it on the floor, and she, like, I, I think the in- implication was intentionally steps on it. Yeah. Um, so, like, I don't really know what's going on with that, because, like, it says, Dear Alice, at the top of the letter. Mm-hmm. And I I can, like, we just skim over it, so I don't really know exactly what the letter says, but the the implication I got from the way in which the letter was presented, and this is like a filmmaking thing, is that it's a breakup letter. And so if we go with the died in a car crash thing, he wrote her a breakup letter, tried to leave Silent Hill, died in a car crash, and his spirit's trapped there, and she won't let him go. Mm. Um, so he can't even pass on question mark yeah um either but like yeah. that's a lot of guesswork yeah i'm being really generous to get there yeah um and that's that's just for me it's a problem of just not effectively communicating things because while i will give more credit to let fan films get away with things that are wholly dependent on you understanding the source material um at a certain point like good filmmaking is just it just needs to be good filmmaking right right like the good filmmaking's good filmmaking bad filmmaking's bad filmmaking a uh, hot take of the day and uh, like you mentioned in this whole ghost dimension thing helps the case a little bit but i'm still i'm just not feeling it i feel like there's just a a clear lack of concise communication to the audience mm-hmm um yeah there is a there's an old herb i don't know how old because it involves elevators but there's an urban legend where um like there's a building where if you hit a certain uh pattern of floor numbers when you get to like the final floor it's like like a ghost dimension or something like that it's like a parallel universe um and if you're not careful you could get trapped in there or even if you get out of the building you're still in the parallel universe and can't touch and relate to people anymore um and i i think that's i don't know if that urban legend came before silent hill or silent hill was influenced by that uh i do know that's an aspect of the at least the film i i think it's an aspect of the the series and universe lore uh and i i mean you might as well be fucking dead you might as well be a real mm-hmm. ghost. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that this really didn't work for me. Just on a plot level, but also just on a... You know, this is horror month, and at no point did I feel 
scared or freaked out or anything and so this is something that i thought maybe we could talk about for a few minutes okay um so b movies are pretty commonly horror movies and occasionally comedies uh you don't really see a lot of b rom-coms or dramas or anything (laughs) and when you do they tend to be like the room um and and just not good at all yeah uh but b movies tend to go for horror a lot which is weird because of how seldom it tends to actually work. Um, I don't know. How do you feel? Do you feel B-movies pull off genuine horror enough or just kind of have a charm to them? Well, the problem is um, sometimes they just... some. I, I've seen plenty of B-horror films over the years made by like you know small studios and uh independent creators and people just you know make it a film and mm-hmm. i've seen like several different kind of degrees of films like this like you know some people like to make a horror comedy because they don't really no i probably shouldn't say that but that that some like go for the easy comedy because they really can't do horror uh mm-hmm. but they like shooting zombies i don't know um i'm not a big fan of that that kind of horror um there is because because sometimes visual effects and mood and atmosphere are difficult to do uh, when they're done well in a b horror film that does kind of work to its advantage uh, because mm-hmm. you're less in a safe place like when you watch a big studio horror film with like Anthony Hopkins or something like that, like well, it's Anthony Hopkins. It's like made by you know Twentieth Century Fox. It's big budget, uh, but when it has a smaller studio, when you kind of feel like I don't know, like kind of the new grittiness to a film that does kind of make it a little bit more unnerving, which I think is why um, horror is a little bit more popular with. Uh, uh, low budgeted independent uh, B projects. Okay, and I don't know. It's just something to think about because, like, I watched this, and there's some mildly unsettling stuff. Like he comes around the corner, and there's that guy's face being all blurry and shit. I mean, that's like, it's a cool effect. I think it was pulled off. Uh, as far as VFX wise, I thought it was pulled off reasonably well. I didn't feel like scared or unsettled by it. And it was kind of the showiest thing they had. Otherwise, he was just kind of walking around a parking garage, walking <laughs> around the woods, walking down the street. And I'm like, eh, maybe if I were more into Silent Hill, some of this atmosphere would work a little better for me. Mm-hmm. But as is, I'm like, it's not really scary. It's just kind of there. I found it a little bit more... Uh... I, I actually was um, sucked in a little bit by the atmosphere of it, uh, where it's not like yeah, like completely out there scary. Uh, I did find the headless uh, spirit that he he comes across rather creepy, and then you know he runs away from it. I thought that was kind of oh yeah. I, was it headless or I thought it was his body, but the head was on backwards. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I probably shouldn't say it that way. Yeah, the head was kind of on backwards or something like that, and I think it was supposed to be him um oh like maybe that's how his body was after the crash that we're imagining or something possibly and yeah i thought that was pretty effective it wasn't like outright scary but it was definitely creepy and uh i do know that part of what makes silent hill successful is um uh the loneliness of, of being like stuck somewhere with no one around uh which can be scary and Mm-hmm. Uh, it can be unnerving, uh, especially if there's like no hope of being found or finding anybody. Um, I think he does that pretty decently uh, in the film. It does. It feels like it's trying to create and invoke uh, a certain um, emotion more than just being uh, scary. Mm-hmm. And I and horror can certainly cover a range of things obviously jump scare doesn't mean something's actually scary and yeah and so like that's the easy one to go to but you know not everyone's fucking kubrick not everyone can turn atmosphere into scariness yeah. you know oh yeah um 
Well, I mean, so, I, I guess yeah, I couldn't have gone like a, a feature length film doing this. Um, yeah, but you know, for the for the short film that you know we're lauded, you know, I think he does a decent job at it. Um, because you know, there are some films that I can kind of get into the groove of you know that kind of atmosphere. Like I'm a huge fan of um, uh, Carnival of Souls, which has a lot of that. Uh, mm -hmm. It does have some outright scares of it in it uh for the time but the thing that i think most like really affects me is like the the long creepy periods where she feels the the character in the film feels like she's being like stalked and she's being uh you know separated from humanity and she's you know getting more and more desolate oh uh, yeah i i think that can be really effective um i'm th i'm not saying this was as effective as that uh, but it's definitely what it was trying to evoke. And, you know, for the 10, 12 minutes it was uh, there, it certainly did. I, I felt, you know, kind of achieved that level. All right. And I guess that's fair because th that does become more of a subjective thing. Um, for me, I don't know, I was so lost at a certain point and trying to just figure out what exactly was going on that I, I don't know, I didn't really connect with much of any of it. Yeah. Even on that deeper emotional level because... I don't know, for me, that's something I usually have, where in order for me to start thinking themes and and um, atmosphere and context and stuff like that, I kind of need to know what's going on first. Because mm -hmm. um, otherwise my mind tends to drift and I tend to think about what's going on if I'm not, if I don't have a, a really solid grasp on it already. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I was feeling here. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's and I don't know. that's a legitimate uh, reaction. That's that, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, so I don't know. That's kind of where I am on it. Um, what do you think about the uh, the cinematography of it, though? Uh, I thought it was uh, serviceable. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some um, some nice shots uh, where you know they did kind of this filter effect on uh, some of the period, and I think. He uh, did a pretty decent job as creating that kind of like foggy effect, uh, mm -hmm. without yeah, without yeah. really having like a fog machine. I'm guessing, uh, but you know, you still definitely get that really kind of ashy, you know, look to it. Yeah, it's weird because it's all in black and white, but it doesn't quite feel that way. It feels like there's supposed to be color. It's just so hazy. Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, so I did like that. That's a, a cool color grading thing that they did. Um, the cinematography actually I did quite like. I, I thought it was not great or anything, but definitely definitely uh, helped and probably the best thing about the project for me. Mm -hmm. um, I particularly like the shot of him in the woods where it's got the red tint to everything that just felt like it stood out in a really big way and, and felt really intense because of it, because of it and so that quite helped. Um, and I don't know, I just, I, I liked the, the way this was shot quite a bit, particularly because it's so dark and on lower budget stuff, it's really hard to shoot dark things. Oh, so yes. I don't know if, I don't know if they shot day for night or what they did, but it looks good. And that's, you know, it's to be commended on a low budget kind of project like this. So I was, I was quite pleased with that. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I think it does a really good job kind of evoking the atmosphere they're, they're trying to do. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, like, um, the photography on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that was pretty good. Um, editing didn't have a ton going on. It's, it's more or less just a bunch of straight cuts. But, you know, uh, I will, I will kind of get on the sound editing a little bit. The, uh, the little dialogue we get is really hard to hear. Mm -hmm. I had to... Uh, go back, put on headphones, and listen to the lines between he and Alice. Yeah. It, and also re-listen to his little monologue. It is a little muffled. And also, I I don't know too much about the the filmmaker, although I do, do believe that probably English is the second language. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it did sound like uh, there wasn't quite a grasp on the... Just the words sounded a bit off, and so it, it made the, the script a little bit harder to, to understand. Mm -hmm. I almost wish he had just done it in his own... Uh, you know, native language, if that was the case. Um, I do, I did like 
the thing I did like, though, is, you know, it was nice hearing an accent in this situation. And, uh, from, you know, it, it was kind of pleasing to hear when I, when I could hear it uh, correctly. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think he was wise enough not to uh, put in too much dialogue if that was the case. Yeah. Like if this, yeah, like if this get like Silent Hill takes place in America, and I guess, you know, maybe the character is supposed to be uh, American or living in America, um, so I guess you know he he didn't want to like overdo it, and that that's probably a wise choice. And th in this type of like atmosphere, you really don't need that much dialogue anyway. So you know, I I thought I thought that was pretty well done as far as I'm concerned. That's fair. Um... <laughs> I just love the idea of like someone coming to America and moving to Silent Hill because they don't understand how fucking creepy the name of that town sounds. How fucking terrible would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, someone's fucking like mailing something to Silent Hill and everyone at the post office is like, yeah, fuck that place. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. The. the accent thing like i don't really care uh about someone's accent i just care about like how cr clear the dialogue is and yeah you know dubbing is your friend there's like this weird sense that dubbing uh adr work is like cheaper or something or, or makes something come off as less quality most films before the mid 80s were done completely adr so you know you can do it right just do multiple takes it'll be fine uh, and, and often your audio audio quality will sound better i don't know if this was done adr or done adr poorly um but it just sounded like they're maybe using micro or uh microphone or onset microphone or camera audio and it didn't sound very good so yeah um just things to think about the uh visual editing though a lot of just you know pretty straight simple cuts there are a couple uh what I thought were um, pan wipes that, that looked pretty good, too. Um, probably the best shot for me is the uh, the face-twitching guy at the top of the stairwell. I thought that was pretty cool looking. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a shot for yourself, that, or for your under your opinion, that worked really well? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, man, I just like the turnaround head guy. I, yeah. yeah. I really like that, that, that moment. Okay. All right. Well, Manos, you want to go ahead and go on to ratings? No. No? What do you want to talk about instead? <laughs> you know, let's talk about... No, nah, it's fine. Let's do it. Oh, uh, hey, let's talk about reviews of the Silent Hill film uh, Lost Love. And I would probably give this maybe, uh, maybe two and a half turned around heads. All right. Is that just random, or was that actually timed? Uh, that's my sound machine sound effect thing, which I never use as much as I should. Oh, <laughs> uh, I really should use this more because I love it. Oh, I'm sure everyone listening with headphones, like myself, really enjoyed it. Oh yeah, <gasps> they're out there clap. They're out there very happy about it. Oh god. Ew gimmicks that's what geeky gentleman was missing i'm a morning dj gimmicks yeah apparently <laughs> w w welcome to g -g 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 geeky gentleman <laughs> yeah uh, welcome to mm. bring, uh, bring out your morning here with uh manos in the bilch <laughs> <laughs> oh my all right manos are you up for a or, or, oh i still gotta do my radio yeah. don't i um yeah, I'm going to go for a bit lower than you. I'm going to go two out of five uh, Dear Alice letters. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, me too. Okay. Manos, are you up for a really long fan film? No. No? <laughs> Not at all. Why? What do you have in uh, mind? <laughs> Castlevania, Hymn of Blood clocking in at one hour and 11 minutes holy fuck right yeah uh That's longer so than let's movie. go from one video yeah let's go from one video game that neither of us have played 
to another video game that I don't think either of us have played. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Should be fun. I, yeah, it should be fun. I know Castlevania is Dracula. You were cutting out a bit there. Can you say that again? Dracula or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Dracula. Hello? Yeah, yeah. You're, oh, yeah. You're, you're good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll do we'll do Castlevania Hymn of Blood uh, next week. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Uh, until next time, we are your ghouly gentlemen. <laughs> and we will be discussing things from beyond the grave. I will be lurking for you.